spirit of keeping the cat thing going on. Here's a cat on my chair in my room while we start this. So let's talk, uh, let's talk about getting started in the Third World War game. And you know what, cat? You're out here. Oh my god, you're fat. <clears throat> okay. There's a very extensive sequence of play for this game, and as long as you try and follow along mostly, you arguably can't screw up too bad. So, what I've done, and yes, there's supposed to be one for each side, but since I'm playing by myself, let's keep it all on the one track and keep it convenient for me. Uh, what I've done is allocated escorts and missions and to work out what I want to do for the turn in the first turn, given how important the first turn is. And so as I've laid out all these escorts that I want to provide for all these different missions that I wish to conduct over the course of the turn, that's driving what my air superiority allocation will be. And then of course, uh, I've got additional units that I'm putting in there to uh, run intercepts if there's opportunities for that. And of course, then to try and bump the numbers up to uh, put the numbers such that it'll make it difficult for the NATO player to want to have or try and get air superiority. And as you uh, may or may not know, in the Third World War uh, game, that uh, <coughs> excuse me, that air superiority is a real simple concept. He who puts the most planes into the air superiority box has air superiority. And all that really allows you to do is to elect to place more than one, but no more than two, uh, intercept aircraft on any given mission. So if I'm going to intercept you, uh, and you're running uh, you know, a ground support attack or something like that, I can send two aircraft if I really care about it enough to try and knock you out of the game, which means I'll be able to probably bounce or potentially bounce the strike aircraft and the escort. So it's kind of a cool concept. Similarly for the uh, NATO player, uh, in the very first turn, they can't conduct any uh, of those air, deep, air, uh, deep strikes is what they're called. And we'll talk about what those deep strikes are a little bit later on and when we actually go through the exercise of uh, conducting them and we'll have a look at how they work and things like that. But there are basically uh, local missions and then deep strike missions is how I would break them down. I'm sure they have some other terminology here, but that's how I, uh, that's how I look at it. And we've done the same thing. So here, uh, although the US and NATO forces cannot conduct deep strikes in the first turn, what they can do in the first packed segment is use these bottom numbers across the, the these numbers across here, and that's uh, representative of the number of dice they're going to roll. They uh, they can uh, attack. Uh, they can do ground strikes against stacks of units. So uh, we've kind of got those laid out. We've got support aircraft for them that are going to uh, escort them, and then we've got uh, some support aircraft allocated to provide ground support when uh, it comes time to co for combat. And then um, we've just got a bunch of other stuff in here that we'll probably try and use uh, during the tail end of turn one where perhaps, you know, one or two D6s rolled well might make a difference. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So we're ready to kick off the first turn of the battle for Germany in the Third World War from the GDW system from back in 85. And we'll see how we go. I'll uh, tune in with you or, or uh, dial, dial back to you in just a little bit.